Um, well, welcome back to week six of our Faithful Father series. In this series, we have been looking at the many ways that the Heavenly Father is faithful to us and has been faithful to us. We need to know and trust in his faithfulness so we don't treat him like he's never done anything for us. Remember that? We've said that over and over and over again. We need to remember all that God has done for us so we don't treat him every time like like we don't know that he's done something for us before or that he hasn't done something for us before. We need to know and trust that he has. Knowing that he is faithful helps us to trust in him today, and it helps us to trust in him in the future as well as we grow deeper in our relationship with him. We need to be reminded that the Heavenly Father is faithful in the past, and he, will, he is faithful now, and he will forever be faithful. You've heard that for at least, hopefully your entire life, lifetime, but at least the last five weeks, you have heard that God is faithful, and we have looked at that uh, over and over again. Um, we need to remember that faithfulness is part of the nature of God. You need to know that. We've been covering that over and over, and it is so important. Faithfulness is listed in the ultimate description the Lord gives of himself in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. This uh, passage is our theme passage for this uh, series. It's not going to be on your handout today. I'll explain that later. It is going to be on the screen. When you guys get a chance as well, can you get the back screen for me? Thank you. It's a heavy tech day, and they're working hard, and I hope that you're listening hard because the Lord has a special message for us today, and he wants us to hear it, but it isn't going to be easy, and so you just need to know that. We're going to get this message from the Lord this morning. Hear the word of the Lord as he describes himself to us today in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and following. He says this, The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, um, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children to the third and fourth generations. This is who the Lord tells us who he is, and this is who we can trust him to be faithful to be. When the Lord describes himself as faithful, he is proclaiming that he will be utterly loyal to be everything that he says that he is as God. And we've seen that through the last five weeks over and over and over again. God is exactly who he claims to be and who he tells us he is in this passage that we have used as our theme verse. The Heavenly Father demonstrated his faithfulness in a wide variety of ways all throughout the beginning of time, all the way up until our time today. And here are some of the things that we've already looked at and the ways that we've already seen his faithfulness. And the first one is this. We've seen that he is faithful to his nature. He has been faithful to be all these things from the very beginning, and he will be this into eternity. And we've seen that he is faithful to keep his promises All throughout scripture, we see him faithfully fulfilling his promises. And we as his children know that there are some left to be fulfilled, right? And we are anxiously anticipating the fulfillment of the return of Jesus Christ and the the fulfillment of the promise of eternal life that he has given us. We know that he will fulfill that because he is faithful to his promises and he always has been and he always will be. We also looked at the way that he is faithful to enact his unfailing love and he has loved us over and over and over again throughout our lifetime and throughout the beginning. From the very beginning of humanity, he has showed his love to us over and over again. And then we looked at his faithfulness to forgive. And we said, if we are faithful to confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And we, we can all testify that he has done that over and over and over for us individually. But there is another aspect of the Father's faithfulness that we need to know and trust in, and it is this. The Heavenly Father is faithful to punish disobedience and sin. You need to know that. Just as faithful as he is to do all the other things that we talked about, he is faithful to punish 
disobedience and sin. This one makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? You don't have to raise your hand. I can tell by your face, and I've been preparing this all week. This makes us uncomfortable to say, oh, wait, wait a minute. I was good with all of his other faithfulness. I was on board. I was happy about it. But this one, I'm not so sure. But guess what? If you're going to know the fullness of the faithfulness of God, you need to know all of it. And this is part of what he tells us. Many books and teachers cover the attributes of God, but they completely skip over this topic because it is so uncomfortable to wrestle with. They'd just rather not do it. And if I had my choice, I would skip it too. But guess what? I can't. This is the message the Lord has given to us today. So we will wrestle with it and we will understand it because we do truly want to understand. We want to completely understand the fullness of what it means to say the Heavenly Father is faithful. And he's faithful to me, and he'll be faithful to you, and he is faithful in this world. And so we need to know and come to grips with the fact that he is faithful to punish disobedience and sin. As humans, we're okay when other people are punished, aren't we? Everybody okay with your brother or sister get punished? You're like, yeah, give it to them, mom and dad. Let them have it. But what about when it's your turn? Oh, mercy. Let's just forget my sins and my disobedience, and let's just continue to help other people or let other people uh, deal with that. Yet, uh, we, so we love to, to just let other people be punished, but we never think of ourselves as guilty, do we? We don't like to think of ourselves as guilty. We don't like to receive the guilty sentence ourselves and say, look, I, I got to look in the mirror and I got to say, uh, guess what? I have some sins and I have been disobedient to the Lord. But scripture reminds us over and over again that we have all sinned and gone our own ways. We've all fallen short of God's standard. That means that we have all angered God, and we all deserve punishment. We deserve to be punished for our disobedience of sin as well. Now, it would be easy to speak against the sins and the evil of this world and the punishment and the destruction that's going to befall them in God's judgment. We could, I could preach on that all day long. You might amen it. You might be excited about the judgment that's coming on wicked and evil people. But guess what? <clears throat> that really honestly wouldn't do anything for us as individuals. It wouldn't do anything to call us to account to trust in the Heavenly Father more or to, um, to understand that he wants to deal with us in our own personal life. It might even just give us a false sense of security if I just said, well, let's just ignore our sins. Let's just ignore our disobedience. Let's just talk about other people's. Guess what? You could walk out of here thinking, you know what? I'm good. I don't have any problems. I'll just stick on the faithfulness of God and all the good things. And, and this will, I'll just slide under the radar on this one. But guess what? That's not how God sees it. And that's got not his plan for us. We don't want to have a false sense of security and ignore our own guilt and our own sins. So the more helpful and yet painful thing for us to do today is to look at ourselves. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't, don't look at the people around you. Our, our job is to look at ourselves. Look at ourselves and guess who we are. We're the people of God. We're God's people. We need to start by looking at ourselves and honestly evaluating to see if we might be more guilty than we think because we just might find that he would say that we are. You need to know that God always starts his judgment with his own people first. He's done that throughout Scripture, and he will forever do that. He starts judging and dealing with his own house first, and then he moves on dealing with others. Most of us would rather that God would just deal with other people and skip over us, right? Come on, God, we're your people. We're the church. We love you. Just skip over us. And he says, no, that's not my plan. I want you to know me fully first before I deal with the other people. Oh, I I will deal with the other people, no doubt. But this message is for us because he wants to deal with us individually. So for today, let's make this an even more personal statement and say this. The Heavenly Father um, is faithful to punish my disobedience and sin. You can use the word are there if you want, but my. Make it personal. The Heavenly Father is going to be faithful to punish my disobedience and sin. We need to remember that all that we talk about and study today is going to be done in the context of a relationship that we have with the Heavenly Father. Please don't miss that as I continue on today. 
we are in a relationship with the Heavenly Father, and he has already demonstrated his faithfulness to us, his people. And he has demonstrated it over and over and over again. And we've had five weeks of all the happy, good stuff that God does. But guess what? This one's going to be hard, and this one's going to be heavy. It's going to be a little bit different. And we need to realize that the Heavenly Father is just as faithful in this as he is to those other things. He has already demonstrated way more happy faithfulness things to us than this one thing about judgment, but we need to know this one. You must also note well this, that the Heavenly Father says in that passage that we read in, in, uh, in Exodus, I am slow to anger. Do you remember that? We've read that for, for five weeks now. I am slow to anger. It does not say he does not get angry. It says he is slow to anger. So you need to know this. You need to know the Lord does get angry. The Heavenly Father does get angry. And we need to know what angers him. How many of you have, don't raise your hand, how many of you have had to figure out what angers a parent or a teacher or the police officers or whoever? You need to know what angers them and then what do you need to not do? Don't do what angers them. If you didn't pick up on that, that's a bonus lesson for today. If you know something makes somebody angry, don't do what angers them. Anybody had a a bull or a steer that you raised? And they say, don't go out and make the bull mad. Do you know what happens if you do? Bad things will happen if you do that. I mean, if you have had a dog or a neighbor dog and they say, hey, don't mess with him. He gets angry. And and, and bad things will happen to you if you you mess with them. How many of you have still messed with them? That's unwise. We did that last year. Don't do unwise things. So we need to know that God does not say that he doesn't get angry. He says that he's slow to anger. And we're going to see his anger come about today. The passage that we're going to study today will help us understand this more fully, what makes him angry. And we need to take those things to heart today. I want you to remember this as well. He also told us that he would not excuse the guilty. Do you see that in there? We've read that over and over the last several weeks. He says, I I don't excuse the guilty. And I lay the sins of the parents on their children and their grandchildren. Now do you see why people would love to skip over this? Let's just not talk about that. The Lord says, no, I told you this is who I am, and I'm not messing around. This is who I am, and you need to know this about me. So you need to know this as well. And I want you to remember this as we head into this sermon today. We have already covered the Father's faithfulness to forgive if we confess. We sang about that. We've covered that in the last several weeks. You need to know and be reminded, the Lord says, I do forgive if you confess. Today, we will see what happens when people won't confess and they won't change. And we're going to see the anger of God be brought to bear on them. We need to take heed to this today. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 78, and let's explore some instructions about the punishment um, that comes from the Heavenly Father as he confronts um, the disobedience of, and sin in the life of his people. He, he's not just confronting sin in, in, in random people. He's confronting sin and disobedience in his people, the children of Israel. This record of the Heavenly Father's faithfulness to punish his people is a parable for us to learn from. And what we hear should help us to adjust the way that we live in relationship with him, the Heavenly Father. And we should be learning today and learning what angers God, what sins bring out the anger of God. And guess what? That means that's what I don't want to be doing. Uh, And so as we get started, I will point out to you just in brief, your handout looks much differently than it usually does. This is a different sermon today. The scripture is on one side, and you're going to have to fill in the other side with what you're learning along the way. I tried to help you with some um, different colored font. Um, So it's going to be a different sermon today. It's going to be a different outline type thing. So scripture's on the left. Your notes are going to be on the right, and you're going to have to fill in most of those on your own, but I believe that you can do it, all right? And I believe that if you'll do it, at the end, you're going to have a list of the sins that anger God, and that will be exceedingly helpful to us, hopefully in our own lives. So a little bit different today, but stick with me. We'll get through this because the Lord truly wants us to know this, and it truly should change how we live, and you're going to hear why in just a minute, but John already told us Because there's a generation coming behind us who's going to watch what we do. And they're going to either choose to do the same or choose to do something different. 
So the Lord wants us to know this because we're living lives for him or we say we are. Psalms uh, 78 verses, let's start with verses 1 through 8. And hear this lesson for us today. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the, of the Lord about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob, and he gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children, so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they they will in turn teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. And they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. These opening verses give us some uncomfortable settings for what's about to be revealed. It's the true story of their ancestors, right? Who have angered God. They have angered the Heavenly Father, and they will suffer punishment for it. And guess what the, the, the psalmist says? We're not going to hide it. We're going to tell the truth. There, there, there's going to be some painful things revealed here. The psalmist, the psalm is to remind each new generation that they too have a choice on how to relate to God. And he's saying, don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Don't live like these people who were stubborn and hard-headed and rebellious. Learn from them. Don't repeat what they did. Verse 7 gives us the, the desired outcome for each and every one of us. And it says, so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his command. That's the desired outcome for each of us today to not be like these that we're going to read about, to not anger God, to not do these things. So we need to know that is the desired outcome from the very beginning this morning. So let's move into the story from the past that should inform us how not to live. It's in verses 9 through 12, and this is what it says. The warriors of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back and fled on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, and they refused to live by his instructions. They forgot what he had done, the great wonders he had shown them, the miracles he did for their ancestors on the plain of Zoan in the land of Egypt. In these verses, we find the first list of the sins that arouse the Lord's anger. And it's this, they didn't keep his covenant They refused to live by his instructions. doesn't say they didn't know his instructions. It says that they refused to live uh, by his instructions. And it also says that they forgot what he had done. They forgot what he had done. The The Psalms continues there then and lists what he has already done for them so that we know what they forgot about. And these aren't just passing things that they have forgotten. These are pivotal Actions of God in the life of his people. Verses 13 through 16 says this. For he divided the sea and led them through, making the water stand up like walls. In the daytime he led them by a cloud, and all night by a pillar of fire. He split open the rocks in the wilderness to give them water as, uh, as from a gushing spring. And he made streams pour from the rock, making the waters flow down like, ri- like a river. Oh, that seems easily forgotten, right? Pillar of smoke, pillar of uh, cloud, pillar of fire, walking through the, 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 the Dead Sea with, with the, the water parted on both sides. Oh, I can see how they could forget that, can't you? No! No, not at all. Those are the stories we teach the children in children's church, right? Those are the stories that we say, this is who God is, and guess what these people did? They forgot. They chose to forget. Um, and uh, 
this is vitally, it's vitally important to remember what the Heavenly Father has done already. Because over and over, he has already shown these people his faithfulness to provide for them and to enact his love for them by parting the sea, by leading them through the wilderness with unmistakable signs and wonders. He has already done all of those things that are just mentioned. And they, they weren't stories to them. These people who they're talking about, they witnessed it firsthand. They were the generation who did it. And let's see how they respond in verses 17 through 20. These who witnessed the parting of the Red Sea firsthand. These who witnessed God leading them in an unmistakable way. Verse 17 and and following says this. Yet they kept on sinning against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They stubbornly tested God in their hearts, demanding the foods that they craved. They even spoke against God himself, saying, God can't give us food in the wilderness. Yes, he can strike a rock so water gushes out, but he can't give people bread and meat. These verses here give us the second list of sins that arouse God's anger. And they are these. Just keep on sinning. Rebel against the Most High. And stubbornly test the Lord in your heart. That angers him. How about this one? Demanding your own way. Not asking for his way, but demanding your own way. And then speaking against the Almighty God himself. Telling him what he can't do. My friends, if you want to know what angers God, that angers God immensely. This angers the Lord. And we will see this in verses 21 and 22 when it says this. When the Lord heard them, he was furious. He wasn't just a little bit upset. Oh, it says he was furious. You ever seen somebody furious? You know that you've pushed them way past the limit. And now their anger is going to be unleashed. When the Lord heard them, he was furious. The fire of his wrath burned against Jacob. Yes, his anger rose against Israel, for they did not believe God or trust him to care for them. Remember, these are the people of God, not some random group of people. These are the people who he parted the waters for. These are the people that he had freed from Egyptian slavery. These are the people that he was leading through the wilderness in unmistakable ways. These are the people that he had given water in the wilderness to drink. And yet they continue to anger and not believe him. They can continue to not trust him. God is furious. The Heavenly Father is angry. So let's see how he responds in his anger. Verses 23 through 29 says this, But he commanded the skies to open. He opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna for them to eat, and he gave them bread for heaven, from heaven. They ate the food of angels. I think we had some of that at the potluck last week, didn't we? The food of angels? Maybe not. All right. He gave them the food of angels. God gave them all that they could hold. He released the east wind in the heavens and guided the south wind by his mighty power. He rained down meat as thick as dust, birds as plentiful as the sand on the seashore. He caused the birds to fall within their camp and all around their tents. The people ate their fill. He gave them what they craved. How many of you would have responded that way when you were fiercely angry? Most of us probably wouldn't, right? God's first response to his people is mercy and compassion, even in the midst of his anger. Do you know why? Because that's what he told us that he was. I am the Lord Yahweh. I am what? Merciful and compassion. What's the third one? I'm slow to anger. The Lord is furious Yet even in his anger, at the very beginning, he is merciful to them, and he gives them the food that they had asked for. But we must know 
even in the midst of him showing his mercy and compassion, which he did. We must also know that there is punishment for disobedience and for sin. And these people didn't believe that the Lord would take care of them. And they didn't trust in the Lord. And so there is punishment that will befall them. Psalms uh, 78 verses 30 and 31 says this, But before they satisfied their cravings, while the meat was yet in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them, and he killed their strongest men, and he struck down the finest the finest of Israel's young men. My friends, there is punishment that comes when we disobey God. He may still be merciful and compassionate in his expression of sin, or in his expression of anger, but that doesn't outdo the punishment. There is still punishment that is there. People of God, we must know that God will punish us, and the reason he does it is to get our attention, to get us to stop disobeying, and stop sinning. Did you know that? You know that as a parent, don't you? Because you had to do the same thing to your kids. If you just tell them or give them warnings, or if you do that again, mommy's going to be angry. If you do that again, daddy's going to be angry. If you do that again, we're going to call grandma. If you do that, nothing changes, right? Nothing changes until what? Punishment comes. And the punishment that makes them pause and say, wow, that was severe. I don't ever want to have that happen to me again. I had better change my ways. The Lord punishes us, and he doesn't apologize for it. Do you know why? Because he wants us to change our ways. And what are the broken ways in which we live? Not trusting him and disobeying him over and over and over again. And it isn't a game to him, just like it isn't a game, hopefully, to you and your children. He says, I will punish you to get you to stop living like this. So let's see how these people respond to God's compassion and his mercy to give them the food that they had asked for, but then also respond to the harsh punishment that he has bestowed upon them. Verse 32 says this, but in spite of this, the people kept sinning. Despite his wonders, they refused to trust him. They ain't changing. They're not going to trust him. He gave them what they asked for, and still they wouldn't believe, and still they wouldn't trust. Man, what about the guy that we see in the mirror every day? What about all the things the Lord has done for each of us? And sometimes still we won't stop. And still, we won't turn. We'll continue to do our own thing. These people did the same thing. So this is the third list of sins that arouse the Lord's anger. Just keep on sinning. It will anger the Lord, I guarantee it. And refuse, continue to refuse to trust him. After all that he does for you, just continue to refuse to trust him. And you will anger the Lord. And you will suffer his punishment. So let's see how the Lord responds to their choice because it is their choice to respond, and they do. Verse 33, this is how the Lord responds to their choice. So he ended their lives in failure, their years in terror. Wow, that sounds pretty serious to me. He ended their lives, and it wasn't a peaceful death, was it? He ended their lives in the wilderness. Their lives were utter failures. Do you remember what we explained weeks ago about how it is to judge your life appropriately? Did you live to glorify God? Did you live in worship of God? Did you live to honor the Lord? And guess what? These people didn't. And guess what? Their lives were ended in failure. And their years in terror, they did not have a peaceful end to their lives because of their choices. The Lord is not messing around. We need to know the Lord isn't messing around when it comes to the continued choice to sin and the continued choice to reject him. He has a limit that he will put up with, and then he will bring it to an end. And it is the end of your life and mine. There's more. Let's read on. 34 through 46, or we'll read on. 34 is what we're picking up. Then when God began killing them, they finally sought him. They repented and took, uh, took God seriously. Then they remembered that God was their rock, 
the, the, the God, that God most high was their redeemer, but all they gave him was lip service, and they lied to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. Even after all of this, they, they haven't changed. So this is the fourth list that we find here of the sins that arouse God's anger, and it's this. Just go ahead and give him lip service only. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that that angers God, but uh, it'd be okay. Just give him lip service. Or continue lying to God. I, I didn't do that. that. That wasn't my fault. Just keep lying to God. Go ahead. Continue to have a heart that's not loyal to him. Have a divided heart. Have a heart that's not for him at all. Just keep doing that. That'll, that'll anger him greatly. And keep on not keeping his covenant. Every time we do that, that angers God. Let's see how God responds to these people as they continue in their pattern of uh, disobedience and sin. Verse 38 and 39 says this, Yet he was merciful and forgave their sins. Did you see that coming? I wouldn't have done that. Would you? Probably not. Do you know why he did it? Because it's who he is. He isn't playing around. When he tells us who he is, we can count on it. And he shows up as compassionate and merciful to them again, even in the midst of being angry with them. It's unbelievable. But it's who he is, and it's what he does for us. Yet he was merciful and forgave their sins and did not destroy them at all. Many times he held back his anger, and he did not unleash his fury. For he remembered that they were mere mortal, uh, gone like a breath of wind that never returns. Once again, we have a merciful response from the Heavenly Father, even in the midst of his anger. You see, people want to say, oh, God gets angry all the time. Yeah, for no good reason, right? You better look in the mirror and you better read the scripture. The Lord does get angry, but that's what he tells us. I'm restrained in my anger. In my anger, you will also find mercy and compassion because of who I am, not because you deserve it. Remember that? We don't deserve any of that. We deserve the punishment that is rightfully ours. But God says, I am merciful and I'm compassionate. So once again, he displays mercy and compassion to them. And he is faithful to forgive. Didn't he tell us he was? He told us that he was. And he is again. He is faithful to forgive and to restrain his anger even in this moment. Let's read on as more of the relationship and his, between God and his people continue. Verses 40 through 43 says this, How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness. They grieved his heart in the dry wasteland. Again and again they tested God's patience and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power and how he rescued them from their enemies. They did not remember the, uh, his miraculous signs in Egypt, the, the, his wonders on the plains of Zoan. <clears throat> in these verses, we have the fifth list of sins that arouse the Lord's anger. These people just keep on rebelling. It's in their heart to do, and they just keep on doing it. And they grieve the heart of God. My friends, you don't ever want to do that. Do you know why? Because he created you for so much more than sin and disobedience. And when he sees people continue to live in that way, it grieves his heart. Just like any parent who sees their kid live in a disobedient way. It grieves the heart of a parent. We see it over and over and over again to see them not living for the Lord. But guess what? It grieves the father's heart as well. Because he says, man, I didn't make these people for this. I didn't bless them so they could continue to live like this. And he grieves his heart, and they grieved his heart in the desert. They tested his patience. They provoked him. And they did not remember all the ways that he displayed his faithfulness for them, though it was many. And though they lived in it day after day after day, God's faithfulness. The verses that follow remind us yet again of the many ways the Heavenly Father has displayed his power to them, how they experienced it personally and how they benefited from it themselves and how he rescued them from, his, from their slavery in Egypt. These are the miraculous signs and wonders that he has already done 
on their behalf that they could be rescued and that they could have a, a, a promised life with him in the promised land. Uh, verses 44 through 55 says this, for he, return, for he turned the rivers into blood so no one could drink from the streams. He sent the swarm of flies to consume them, the hordes of frogs to ruin them. He gave their crops to caterpillars and their harvest was consumed by the, loco, by the locust. He destroyed their grapevines with hail and shattered the sycamore figs with sleet. He abandoned the cattle to the hail, their livestock to the bolts of lightning. It's the plagues. Do you recognize it? It's the plagues that he used to get them out of Egypt. And then it goes on. Verse uh, 49. He, leased, he loosed on them his fierce anger. He let his fury rage, uh, all of his fury rage and hostility. He dispatched against them a band of destroying angels. He turned his anger against them. He did not spare the Egyptians' life, lives, but ra- ravaged them with a plague. He killed the oldest son in each Egyptian family, the flower of youth throughout the land of Egypt. But he led his own people like a flock of sheep, guiding them safely through the wilderness. He kept them safe so they were not afraid, um, but the sea covered their enemies. He brought them through the border to he brought them to the border of his holy land, uh, to this land of hills he had won for them. He drove out the nations before them, and he gave them their inheritance by lot. He settled the tribes of Israel into their homes. <clears throat> These are the things the Lord has already done for them when this scripture is written, when the, when the psalm is written. All of these things the Heavenly Father has already done, but still these people are choosing to forget. They don't remember. They choose not to do that. These aren't things that you easily forget, are they? They're not. How many things, how many big things has the Lord done in our lives? And yet, what are we prone to for doing? Forgetting and not remembering. The story continues in this relationship between God and his people in verses 56 through 58. And it tells us how they continue to act towards him. Verse 56 says this, but they kept testing and rebelling against God most high. They did not obey his laws. They turned back and they they turned back and were as faithless as their parents. They were as undependable as a crooked bow. They angered God by building shrines to other gods. They made him jealous with their idols. These verses contain the sixth list of sins that arouse God's anger and you can guarantee that it does just continue testing and rebelling against God and you will get his anger going don't obey his laws continue being faithless and not trusting in him continue to be undependable continue to worship other gods and his anger will burn and his justice and punishment will come. As you might guess, the Heavenly Father's punishment is to be expected again. Because guess what? He is faithful to punish our sins and disobedience. And he's faithful every time. Psalms uh, verses 59 through 64 says this. When God heard them, he was very angry and here comes the punishment and he completely rejected Israel then he abandoned his dwelling at Shiloh the tabernacle where he lived among the people he allowed the ark of his might to be to be captured he surrendered his glory into enemy hands he gave his people over to be butchered by the sword because he was so angry with his own people, his special possession. Their young men were killed by fire. Their young women died before singing their wedding songs. Their priests were slaughtered and their widows could not mourn their deaths. We must understand that there is punishment for continued disobedience 
in sin. God isn't messing around. He is who he says that he is, and he will do what he says that he will do. And he says, I will be faithful to punish sin and disobedience, and you will not get away with it. I will not wink at it. I will not let it go unpunished if it goes unrepented and unchanged in your heart. I will bring punishment on that. The Heavenly Father takes seriously the rejection of himself. Is there any wonder why? shouldn't be. And he punishes, his punishment demonstrates the importance that he places on that relationship. So we we think, oh, God just punishes us because we don't deserve it. No. He tells us he punishes us like a loving father. Why? Because he cherishes our relationship. Because he knows that he made us for more than that. And he wants more than that, not from us. Remember, we've said this over and over, for us. And he knows the only way to get that is to live obedient lives to him. He can't bless disobedience. He can't allow that to, uh, to remain. So he brings punishment on us. This relationship is so important, in fact, uh, that his anger and punishment won't last forever. We should all be super thankful for that. His punishment and his anger doesn't last forever. The Heavenly Father's mercy and compassion will be faithfully demonstrated again, but there is lasting consequences that remain for these people. Look in verse uh, 65 through 72. Then the Lord rose up as though waking from sleep. Like a warrior aroused from a drunken stupor, he routed his enemies and sent them to eternal shame. But he rejected Joseph's descendants He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. These are lasting consequences from their disobedience and their sin. The Lord has rejected Joseph's descendants, and he has not chosen the tribe of Ephraim. He chose instead the tribe of Judah and Mount Zion, which he loved. There he built his sanctuary as high as the heavens, as solid, as enduring as the earth. He chose his servant David, calling him from a sheep pen. And he took David from tending the ewes and lambs and made him the shepherd of Jacob's descendants, God's own people, Israel. He cared for them with a true heart and he led them with skillful hands. This, uh, this psalm ends with another merciful response from the Heavenly Father. And you need to know that. The Heavenly Father's last word is not anger and punishment. It is mercy and compassion. But you also need to know that the consequences remain because he doesn't let things go unpunished. Here's what I need to share with you so you don't miss it. The consequences remain that remain are this. The old leaders of the people have been rejected. Those who led the people into the promised land are no longer the leaders and will never lead again because the Lord says, I've rejected them. Why? They did not lead the people to do what would honor the Lord. And he he isn't playing around. They've been rejected. He also allowed the place of worship where the tabernacle was to be gone forever. That his own place of worship and the Ark of the Covenant gone because of what the people had done. It's the lasting consequences So those are lasting consequences forever for these people that have disobeyed. Let me just say, we we like to look at other people. You need to look at your own self in the mirror and say, you know what? There are lasting consequences that I live under because of my sin and my choices. Yes, I may be forgiven. Yes, I may be able to move on with the Lord. He may be able to do new things, but guess what? Sometimes in our lives, there's consequences that remain from the choices of sin and disobedience that have happened in our lives And we have to live with that and live that out in the midst of the rest of the things that God does for us. Don't miss that. He does all the other things and he gives us mercy and compassion. But guess what? Sometimes the consequences remain and they're reminders to us, don't ever do that again because that makes God angry. And he leaves those personal reminders in there for us so we don't forget either. Those are hard things to talk about. Those are hard things to accept. But if we truly understand the fullness of the Father's faithfulness, we need to know he is faithful to punish sin and disobedience because he's serious about this relationship and we need to get serious about it as well. 
in mercy and compassion, the Heavenly Father does two last things for his people as far as this psalm goes. He faithfully provides them with a new leader. We read that as King David. He faithfully provides a new leader. He's rejected the old, but he doesn't leave them leaderless. He gives them a new leader, and this new leader has a heart after God. Is supposed to lead the people to be the people of God like they were intended to be. So he rejects the old leader, and he gives them a new leader. He also gives them a new place of worship. He gives them the temple. And that's a whole another discussion, but you need to know. He doesn't leave them forever without a place to worship him or without a place to come and meet him or without a place to commune with him. But for a while, it's gone. And, and it will never go back to being the, the, the tabernacle again. It is now the temple. So the Lord provides mercy and compassion to his people once again, even after bringing punishment for their sins. Children of God, we need to learn from the lessons of this psalm. The Heavenly Father is faithful to be all that he says that he is. And that includes that he is faithful to punish disobedience and sin. And we desperately need to know that. You need to realize that in your own life. He is also faithful and uh, faithful to offer us mercy and compassion so that we might choose to live in the ways that would please and honor him. My friends, you, I hope, created the list on the side of your sheet there of all the things that anger God. Don't do that. It's not rocket science. Peruse that list. It's not that hard. But it's, guess what? It's what an unsurrendered heart does. Disobeys. Speaks badly of God, all those things that you have written down. Don't live like that. God's telling us that angers me and that will bring my punishment. You need to know that. He's faithful to do all that he says. He'll do it for us personally. He does it for his people collectively as church groups. He does it for nations. If you think he's joking, you need only look back through the history of the ancestors in the Bible and the ancestors of the world and see what happens to every generation and every nation that rejects the Lord their God and forgets all the things that he has done for them. It brings him great anger and it will bring his punishment on disobedience and sin. We need to know that. And we need to choose to live as the faithful children of God. And we need to remember all that he has done for us so that we can fulfill that desired passage in the front in verse 7 that says, So each generation should set its hope anew on God. That's us. We each have a chance to do that for ourselves. You know what? I'm going to set my heart to follow God. And I'm not going to forget the glorious things that he's done for me or for the past or the things that he has yet promised. And I'm going to obey his commands. That's the desired outcome of this passage. That's the desired outcome of this service. Not that you would walk away and go, wow, God's so angry. (laughs) You better look in the mirror and ask, why did God get angry? We have the choice to not forget We have the choice to continue to live for him and honor him, and he will bless us for it. We don't have to do what angers him, but you do need to know what angers him because that will bring God's judgment upon us. Let me close for us today. You You can stay seated if you like. Heavenly Father, this is a heavy message from you because we don't like to be confronted with our own sin and disobedience. And yet, Lord, there isn't a person in here who hasn't sinned against you or hasn't not gone their own way. Father, forgive us. We don't want to be a disobedient and continual sinning people. Father, we desire to be your people that would not forget. We desire to be your people who would wholly follow after you. Lord, not just paying lip service on Sundays or while we're singing songs or or whatever. But, but that we would be those people whose hearts are truly torn towards you, who truly do trust you, not just for all the good things, but truly trusting you to know that you will punish sin 
and you will punish disobedience as well because you love us. Father, thank you for the fullness of who you are. Lord, may we continue to grow in our understanding of that. And Lord, may it truly change the way we live because you desire to bless. You desire for us to live as your obedient children. Help us to desire that same thing in such a way that it would change the way that we live and that we act towards you and towards others. Lord, help us to do that today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and truly know the, Holy, the Heavenly Father is all that he claims to be. You are dismissed. Thank <clears throat>